Thank you, Mark, and good morning. It's uh, so good to be back with you again. I thank Jeff for his ministry the past two weeks. I was able to watch the last week's sermon, enjoyed it very much, but so good to be back in the pulpit, and particularly on this uh, Easter Sunday, this Resurrection Sunday, we give thanks for that and praise to the Lord for that, and that's what we're going to consider this morning from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 10, so I'll read the the passage, follow along with me as I read, and then we'll have a word of prayer. The... The Lord has been buried at the end of chapter 19. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus took him down from the cross, which was an act of courage on their part. Laid him in Joseph's tomb and buried him with uh, spices, which was uh, a very dignified thing to do and a kind of... uh, testimony to a royal burial that they gave him. And now we read verse uh, 1 of chapter 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. And you are familiar with this through your studies and readings of the Gospel of John that his name is not mentioned in this book. It's attached to the, the, uh, as the author of the book, but we don't find his name in it, and he's the disciple who's missing, and so most agree that this is John who was referred to here. And said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other disciple went forth, and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb And he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together now in a word of prayer. Two weeks ago, I was in a peaceful garden in Jerusalem, standing before an ancient tomb thought by some to be the tomb where Jesus was buried. I don't know that it is. What I do know is What I saw two weeks ago is what the disciples saw 2,000 years ago, a tomb that's empty. That's important. In fact, all of Christianity is based on it. The empty tomb is the proof that the last of the seven sayings Jesus made from the cross is true. To tell us die, it is finished. That was a cry of victory, of the work completed. But at the time he spoke, that may have sounded to some of those standing around the cross like a a cry of defeat. And if Jesus' life had ended there with his death and burial, it is finished would have meant he was conquered by death and his life a complete loss. But it didn't end there. Three days later, the tomb was found empty. That was the proof of the victory, or as someone said, the resurrection is God's amen to Jesus' loud cry, it is finished. That's what we celebrate today and every Sunday Sunday. 
So let's look at John's account of the resurrection and the evidence for it with the moved stone, the empty tomb, and the grave clothes. It was early in the morning when these things were first discovered. John begins the chapter. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark. John could have described her arrival as being at early dawn, as the other Gospels do, but John gives the the time in a more suggestive way, with some symbolism intended. She came while it was dark, and darkness is a prominent symbol in John's writings. It illustrates the ignorance and the spiritual condition of the unbelieving world. But here it illustrates Mary's understanding, because when she came to the tomb, her knowledge of Jesus' condition differed little from that of the world's. She was in the dark. But that was true of all of the Lord's followers that Sunday morning. Their devotion to Jesus had not dimmed. It was brave devotion to Jesus that moved Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus to, as John recorded in chapter 19, to take his body down from the cross and give it a dignified burial. In fact, give it a royal burial with spices. But spices were used to cover the offensive effects of decay. And the fact that they buried him in that way shows that they expected Jesus' body to remain in the tomb. When the large stone was rolled in place and they walked away, they left with great sadness and without hope. It was the same with the disciples. They spent their Sabbath in sorrow, even though Jesus had told them clearly that he would suffer and he would die, but on the third day he would rise again. He told them that on more than one occasion, but they didn't grasp that truth. And so for them, that first Easter morning began in darkness, just as it did for Mary Magdalene. Now, Mary is a story in herself. She is an example of loving dedication to Jesus Christ. We are first introduced to her in John's Gospel at the cross. She is one of four women that he mentions in chapter 19. She had remained to the end of it, then following Joseph and Nicodemus to the grave, she was able to know exactly where his body was laid. As the sun set, she left and she waited until Sabbath ended. Then Sunday morning, even before the sun had risen, she returned, drawn back to the tomb by her love for Christ. In fact, someone said she was the last at his cross and the first at his grave. She could not rest till she was up to seek him. We know why. In chapter 8 of Luke's gospel, he records that when Jesus healed her, seven demons had gone out. Now you can imagine what kind of life she must have lived, a woman who had seven demons. She lived a life, no doubt, of mental torment, of fear and despair, but Jesus delivered her from that. He he gave back to her a sound mind. She, She was like a brand plucked from the fire. But for all her love for Jesus, she lacked understanding. So when she arrived at the tomb, she was shocked and deeply disturbed by what she found. She saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. Her first thought was grave robbers. That's a common explanation for the empty tomb, even today. There must be some explanation apart from the supernatural, and and that seems reasonable. Did to Mary. That was the first thing she thought. So thinking that the tomb had been violated, she ran off to tell Peter and John. She wasn't alone when this happened. We, We know from the other Gospels that she had come to the tomb with other women. John doesn't mention that but does suggest it 
in what he said and what she said to the disciples. They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Her statement, we do not know, indicates that she had been in the company with the other women. But John's purpose was to single out Mary. The gospel writers do that. They sometimes leave out details that other gospel writers include. There's no contradiction. They edited their material to focus on what they wanted to focus on. And John wanted to focus upon Mary, so he singles her out. He was interested in her response and the Lord's appearance to her later. So he focused on her as one of the central figures of chapter 20. And from Mary's account of what she saw, there's no indication that she thought of a resurrection. That 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 idea had even entered her mind. I mention that because one of the theories of the resurrection is uh, mass hallucination. And so these people were expecting a resurrection and that's what uh, they were able to imagine. But there was no expectation of a resurrection among any of these people. I heard someone give an um, advertisement for his sermon the other day, uh, his Easter sermon. It was about people of faith and how they came looking for the living in a graveyard. But they didn't come looking for the living. They weren't expecting the living. They weren't expecting the resurrection. And we see that in the details of this. And from Mary's account, we get that indication. Uh, there, there's no, as I say, indication that she gave any thought to this, even though she saw all of the evidence for it. It was right there. Verse 1 reports that she saw the stone taken away. And that description implies a, a supernatural removal of it. The verb has the meaning lift up, take up. So it wasn't just rolled away. It, it was literally lifted up out of the groove in which it was set, and it was lying on the ground. It was a large stone that was removed. We know that from Mark's account in Mark 16 and verse 4. He, he describes it as extremely large, which may imply, as we see from our text, being lifted up, force or violence, so that John was indicating that a great power had moved the stone. Matthew tells us that an angel moved it. And our first thought is that he moved the stone in order to let Christ out. That wasn't the reason. Jesus could pass through closed doors as, as he will demonstrate uh, later in the gospel. He could walk through solid walls. The stone wasn't moved to let Christ out, but to let the disciples in so they could see and know the good news of his victory and power over the grave. But when Mary first saw it, it wasn't good news to her. She interpreted the evidence of the resurrection as a, as a tragedy. They have taken away the Lord. Her response was not untypical of Christians when they are in difficulty. They, well, we sometimes lose perspective and draw the wrong conclusion from the events around us, much as Jacob did in Genesis 42. I love this passage because it's so typical of all of us. Canaan was in a famine. Everything was dying. He thought his favorite son, Joseph, was long dead, killed by a wild beast. And that another son, Simeon, was a prisoner in Egypt, lost to him forever. And now his sons want to take his youngest son, Benjamin, with them down to Egypt to get grain. And so in despair, he cried out, Joseph is no more and Simeon is no more. And you would take Benjamin. All these things are against me. When in fact, all those things were for him. Simeon was well Joseph was alive and ruling Egypt, and soon Jacob would be reunited with them and live in prosperity. Well, Mary made the same error. She misinterpreted the facts. The empty tomb was good news and the first step in her reunion with the Lord. But she had not 
misinterpreted the facts by the Lord's teaching. Again, he had on more than one occasion told the disciples that he would be raised from the dead. But because she and the others neglected the Lord's teaching, they couldn't see the blessing when the evidence was right there before their eyes. So she assumed the body was stolen. That's what we all do when we try to interpret events in our lives apart from God's revelation, apart from the Word of God. That's why we need to be so attentive to Scripture and to what God has revealed. He speaks to all of the details of life and all of the issues that we face. We face an alarming situation and we respond so often as Jacob did or as the world does with despair. That happened here. When she arrived and told the disciples what she and the others had found, they, they were puzzled by it. They didn't pause to ask questions. They quickly ran off to investigate. Verse 3. So Peter and the other disciple went forth and they were going to the tomb. They were, the two were running together and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. Attempts have been made to give allegorical interpretations to John's arrival at the tomb first, but uh, rather than find symbolism in it, I think it's better to understand that John simply reported the facts, which suggests that he was swifter than Peter because he was younger than Peter. Now, being younger than Peter, we might expect him to be uh, more heedless or uh, uh, less cautious in his behavior, but when he got there, we don't find that at all. He, he becomes very hesitant. He didn't go into the tomb. Maybe he was a, a, bit, a bit spooked about uh, entering into a tomb. We can understand that. Instead, verse 5 states that he stooped and looked in and he saw the linen wrappings lying there. The fact that they were lying there indicates that they were undisturbed. The wrappings and the powdered spices that had been sprinkled between the folds of the linen strips were all still in place, but without the body. Mary had reported that they had taken the Lord, but it, it would have been impossible for grave robbers to have unwrapped the body and then rewrapped the linen bands with the spices. The evidence was that something else had happened, that the body had passed through the clothes. The clothing that he, he left behind would have then collapsed under the weight of 100 pounds of spices so that when John saw them, they were lying flat. From the entrance, though, the entrance of that tomb, looking into the dark sepulcher, John couldn't see everything. In fact, F.F. F. Bruce describes John as peeping into the tomb. Then Peter arrived a moment later, and true to his impetuous personality, he rushed inside the tomb and he looked around. He saw what John had seen, the linen wrappings lying there, but also something that John didn't notice. Verse 7 adds, and the face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. The face cloth was separate from the linen strips, and it had been rolled or wrapped around the Lord's head like a turban, and without spices, so it kept its concave rolled shape. John writes that it was not lying with the wrappings, and... What he means by that is that there was a gap between it and the grave clothes, the space between the head and the shoulders. So everything was arranged in an orderly state, left untouched with no evidence of the wild confusion that would have occurred if grave robbers had entered the tomb. In fact, if grave robbers had stolen the body, they would not have left anything behind. They would have certainly not left the expensive linen there or the valuable spices. And that, that was all there, undisturbed 
without the body. Now, Peter saw all of this, and he looked at it more carefully than John had looked at it. The word used for Peter seeing is different from the word that's used of John peeking in. Here, the word theorio is the word that's used, and we get our word theory from that. It has the idea of a careful look. It has the idea of thought. Peter scrutinized everything, wondering what it all meant. Now again, there's nothing in the text that indicates that Peter understood at that moment what happened. He wasn't expecting a resurrection as none of them were expecting that. He didn't understand. He was scrutinizing it, but we learn John did understand. Peter's entrance into the tomb gave John the courage to enter also, and, and when he did, he saw everything. He saw the grave clothes, he saw the face cloth, and when he got the full picture, the face cloth in relation to the grave clothes, verse 8 says, he saw and believed. The word for seeing here is different from the other words. In verse 5, John saw, but it was like a glance. He peeped in. Here, the word has a sense of seeing with perception, with spiritual understanding. And seeing all these things, the moved stone, the empty tomb, the undisturbed grave clothes, John suddenly understood what had happened. It was the only explanation. Jesus had risen from the dead. But it wasn't just the empty tomb and the grave clothes that caused John to believe and come to this understanding because by itself, an empty tomb is an empty tomb. It must be explained. And the Bible does that. It was the scriptures that John believed. Before that, he says, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. What scripture John meant is not stated it's not clear whether he means a, uh, a single text of Scripture or the Scriptures as a whole, the, the testimony of the entire Old Testament, but it could be Psalm 16, which Mark read for us before the, uh, the service at the beginning. Uh, that, that could likely have been the text that, P, uh, that John was referring to, or Psalm 110, both were cited by Peter on the day of Pentecost as proof of the resurrection. He stood before this large gathering of people, these thousands of people, and he spoke of the Lord's death. And then he quoted David who wrote, You will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Now, it could be said of David that God did not, did not abandon his soul to Hades, but it could not be said of him that he did not undergo decay. And Peter makes that very point. He said, David both died and was buried. In fact, his tomb is with us today, he said. They all knew where it was. But that was not true of Jesus. His tomb was empty. God raised him seven weeks earlier prior to Pentecost. And that, Peter says, is what David prophesied in Psalm 16. He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised from the dead, he said, to which we are all witnesses. In fact, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 speaks of over 500 people who are eyewitnesses to the resurrected Christ. And now he has ascended to heaven. He has taken his seat at God's right hand in fulfillment of Psalm 110. Sit at my right hand, God said to him. What that means is Jesus is the Messiah. He's the fulfillment of Scripture. The one whose death and resurrection David looked ahead to and spoke of. He is the one whom John testifies to as the Christ, the Son of God, who gives life to all who believe in him. And he gives life because he finished the work of salvation. That's what the resurrection means. 
It means that his declaration, it is finished, is true. They're not words of defeat or despair, but of victory. He has accomplished the work of salvation. He paid the full debt of our sin. He has saved his people from their sins. There is nothing left for us to do but receive the great blessing of life that he has gained for us. And do that through faith and faith alone. And the resurrection is the proof of it. Do you realize the good news of that? The Bible is clear. Without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. That is the fundamental teaching of the Bible. From the beginning, when God slew animals in the garden and clothed Adam and Eve with their skins, the Word of God has shown that the shedding of blood is necessary because of sin. All through the Old Testament, Israel offered up bulls and goats and lambs and doves, thousands upon thousands of animals to demonstrate that blood must be shed for forgiveness. But bulls and goats cannot give that, not ultimately. They can't remove sin. They're just a vivid picture and reminder of what is required. And what is required of God is sacrifice. Human effort cannot remove sin. Good works cannot cancel out our crimes. Turning over a new leaf doesn't change the past. Feeling bad and resolving to do better doesn't remove guilt. The Bible is very clear that atonement is only by sacrifice. The satisfaction of divine justice and peace with God, reconciliation, only happens when a sufficient payment for sin is made. Man can't make that. Not one of us can make that. All of us together cannot make that. Only God can. And he's done it. He's put away sin once and for all. He's made atonement. No religion can claim that. Only Christ can give that. And the resurrection is the proof of it. It is the historical proof that God accepted His Son's sacrifice on our behalf and He demonstrated it by raising Him from the dead. The resurrection is God's amen to Christ. It is finished. It's God's vindication of His Son. Now whether John understood all of that, I can't say. But he believed in the resurrection. And we read in verse 10 that the disciples went away again to their own homes. They didn't go searching for the body. There was no need to. They went home. And as they went, you can be sure John rejoiced as he explained to Peter what had happened. When he reached the house, someone in his home must have been overjoyed with the good news Mary, the mother of Jesus, her son and her Savior was alive. That's the good news. We have a living Savior. And because He lives, every believer in Jesus Christ has His life now. Resurrection life now. And the hope of the resurrection of the body to come. And life in the resurrected world to come. That's great news. That's good news that we as believers in Jesus Christ have, but it's news and hope that the world does not have. Twenty years ago, I was in Jerusalem at that same garden tomb I spoke of earlier. I was with a group of people quietly taking the Lord's Supper when the Silence was broken by the Muslim call to prayer from the Al-Aqsa Mosque in the old city. It was a, a strange sound to Western ears, but a vivid reminder that there is another way. A way without a sacrifice and living Savior. A way of works and ritual and personal effort that is never finished and can never satisfy the holy God.
What a joy to know that uh, just as the heavy stone was lifted from the tomb, the crushing burden of sin and guilt has been lifted from every believer by the sacrifice of Christ. And God has said, Amen to it. Have you believed? If not, then look to Jesus who died in the place of sinners so that all who believe in him, simply believe in him, might have the complete forgiveness of sins and life everlasting. His blood cancels out our crimes. It removes all our sins as far as the east is from the west. It casts our guilt behind God's back, never to be seen by him again the empty tomb that no skeptic in history has been able to disprove is the proof we have a living Savior who overcame death. Look to Him, look to Christ, and then rejoice that it is forever finished. Rejoice that you have new life, resurrection life, and the hope of the resurrection to come. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for sending your Son into the world to die for us, and we give thanks and praise to your Son for accepting that mission and doing it fully and completely. And we praise you, and we are so thankful that you raised him from the dead, which is the evidence, the proof that you accepted his sacrifice for us. And that through the blood of the Lamb, we have been cleansed from all of our sin and guilt, and we stand before you fully righteous and acceptable in your sight. And we are sinful still, but you're dealing with that in this life, and you're removing that sin, and you're strengthening our inner man, you're enabling us to, to live a, a life of obedience to you. We could do it in no other way, but... All of that has been confirmed for us. The historical proof has been given in the actual physical, bodily, historical resurrection of your son. It's not a myth. It's not a wish. It's true, and we give you praise and thanks for that great power that overcame death itself. We thank you for him and the salvation we have in him, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.